text this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. This afternoon, brethren, to continue our consideration of the abundant nature of our salvation in Christ Jesus, um, I chose to bring our attention to this text here in the second chapter of Ephesians. Um, The apostle in our text today, he shows us exactly how incredible the salvation of of Jesus Christ really is. That, That those who were once dead in sins, they're not only quickened to be made like Christ, but they're actually raised up to sit in heavenly places with him. That uh, he brings us even even beyond the borders of time into the ages to come and tells us about the things that we are to expect there. That it, it only becomes greater and greater. These are things that, that we can't even imagine the bounds of in the present time. These are things that, that are good to, to consider. And it, it, it just tells us the way in which our salvation tracks, that it just continues to go forward and upward and higher and higher. It, it, it has no peak. It has no limit to it. it to the point to where, uh, he says it in another place, world without end. That's that's the direction in which we're heading in this. Amen. So I very much appreciate the uh, precise nature of the words that the, uh, the Apostle writes here and the manner that he's done things that, uh, in, in, in modern times, people have been more forward to speak speak sloppily when it comes to these things. And uh, I I pray that the Lord will enable me to be able to expound these things in in like manner this morning. So our text begins with a, a sort of divine disjunctive, if you will, but God. Now, uh, this is like a point of change. This is like a point of demarcation. Had, Had God not done something, then this wouldn't have come to pass, but God. Now you remember when Samson defeated heaps upon heaps of Philistines, uh, he says, "And I will say to my soul, so." Oh, never mind. Sorry, it's a different, <laughs> different, different text. He was sore athirst, and he called on the Lord, and he said, "Thou hast given this great deliverance in the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised?" But God clave out a hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water thereout. That's not. That's like our salvation, isn't it? But God. And remember, well, he, that can be for good, but this can also be for bad. You remember the man who went about to tear down his barns and build bigger barns for, for the abundance that he have. And he said, I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods and laid up for many years. Take thine ease and drink and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul, thy soul shall be required of thee. So this is like a point of change here. We know that prior to the verse that we're ta- speaking of, uh, the apostle speaks of the deplorable human condition. He speaks of of the depths to which humanity has fallen, all of the iniquity and all of these things. But as he begins our verse, he sets forth a dividing line, uh, a point in which things changed, and, and only by the one who's capable of, of setting such a change in motion. Yeah. But God, who is rich in mercy, with his great love wherewith he loved us. Now, I don't intend to spend too much time on this point, but I just want to contrast this text with with some of the other versions of what they say. Uh, I I think that there's like a doctrinal error here that they're trying to push, where a lot of them say, He loved us so much, and and for His love for us is so great. And uh, while I'm not trying to make the point that God didn't love us, the, the point is to see the greatness of the love wherewith He loved us, not that He loved us. And the, the, there, there's a difference between the two. One of them leaves us thinking more of ourselves, and the other one thinks us leads us to think of the greatness of this love wherewith He loved us. And the, the question I'm seeking to answer isn't, does God love? God is love. That's not the question. But but what is God's love like? And and how has He chosen to express or exemplify this love? And we're, we're talking about a great love here. There have been a great many words spoken about the love of God that are loose, 
And then they're not really based on Scripture. They're based on what people think of what Scripture means. Uh, people read books about this, and they, they base their thoughts upon that. And I, we want to make sure that, that we, do, we talk about the love of God in a way that doesn't cheapen it. This is a great love. Amen. So to, to kind of get a perspective, I just wanted to look at, at a few texts. And the first one is uh, the text that most people look at when they want to talk about this, John 3.16. For, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now we first notice that love is referred to in, in the past tense, in contrast to some of the other versions that says He loves us. And I'm not, again, I, and it's, it's, it's terrible that you actually have to say this when you talk about these things. I'm not trying to say God doesn't love. That's not what I'm trying to say. Uh, and see, it, it, whenever he talks about it in this way, it points us uh, back to the point in time in which God's love was revealed or demonstrated. And, and this is the demonstration of the love of our God that is, is tied up with this long suffering that he talks about. But that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's pointing back to the time in which Jesus paid for our sins. That was the demonstration of the love of God, that, that he gave his only begotten son. And we notice right away a condition that that this uh, long suffering, this this willingness that none should perish, that it was answered by a provision. There was a, that his love was deposited in the provision of Christ Jesus, and the the text itself implies that those who don't partake of this provision, they are going to perish. That's what it says. It isn't simply God loving them for who they are. It is God in His great love providing a way for them to be in a condition of safety. He, he's, he in His own loving nature and desire that to save, He is making a provision. It says, in, uh, to continue the thought, it says in 1 John, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid His life down for us. And, and he, uh, again, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because He sent His only begotten Son to the world, that we might live through Him. Here is in His, his love, not that we love God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Uh, this is the greatness of the love of God, is, is that it is in Christ Jesus that He gave His only begotten Son. Uh, now, to, to clarify this even further about what he's talking about here, this is in uh, Titus 3, and uh, it's, it gives kind of a contrast. He says, For we ourselves were sometimes foolish and disobedient and deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating in one another. But after that, the kindness of the uh, love of a God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Now, people, uh, as I, they speak too sloppily about this, about the prime motivating factor of God and salvation. And I maintain that regardless of what people have flippantly said about this, it's not that we were so lovable and so worthy of His love. That's not the point. It's not that we were so great in His eyes that He couldn't resist us. It's actually the opposite that makes the love so great. It's that we were actually obnoxious to God. That that the, his, the greatness of seeing in it is that even though we were so low, even though we were so unlovable, the love of God was so great and his desire to be merciful and to save rather than to damn that he might fulfill his eternal purpose in Christ Jesus. He, he made a way by which he could be righteous and make us in a state to where we could be lovable. He could he can maintain both of those things. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He, he made this time. He crafted it in due time. Uh, the, the, we'll, we'll, we'll see in our text also that the, the love which was shown, the provision which was given, it didn't leave those who would partake of it in the category of sinner. And when Jesus um, uh, died for the ungodly, he knew that they would no longer be ungodly once he died for them. When he was going to get the heathen for his inheritance, they wouldn't stay the heathen once he got them. They were going to become his bride. So then, knowing what would come of it, quickened us together with Christ. 
Uh, this is the reason why uh, bro Brother R Ricky touched on this earlier. I think it was Brother Ricky. I don't remember who. But uh, this is the reason why the love of God it's not shouldn't be preached to attempt to win people to Christ. Is that unless the law has done its ministry first, unless you understand your need to provision, you know that you are a sinner, you know that you need Jesus, this is just like talking into the air because you can't understand the love of God. When we have been quickened and enlightened, when we've been made a partaker of Christ, we're able to look back and we can confess, He loved me and He gave Himself for me. Uh, this can't really be described by someone who hasn't experienced it. Uh, the, um, the point of saying this, as we go into our text, the, the course of this great love wherewith He loved us, it continues as we're brought into Christ, and it's experienced on a continually heightened level. There's a, there's a difference in between the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, the love of God that passeth all knowledge, and the, the commending of the love of God towards us while we were yet sinners. There's, there's a difference in between those two. Amen. So quicken together with Christ. We are actually made partakers of the divine nature. That we were actually given a new heart and a new mind in Christ Jesus. We are a new creation. All things have passed away. All old things have passed away. Everything has become new. This is, this is actually how it is in Christ. We're, we're not talking about a ceremony or a mere formality. We're, we're, we're talking about the experience of transformation, actually experiencing transformation. It's, it, it's, it's life from the dead, really. Being, being quickened involves, it, it involves kind of a dexterity, a newfound dexterity. Uh, we, you notice that the, the man who was lame whenever he was healed, he didn't get up and kind of test his legs for a little while and you know, kind of test. He jumped and he leaped and he praised God. And this is, this is the same way in the Spirit. You, you don't have to be in Christ for years and years and years to be able to abound in the Spirit, to be able to jump and leap in the Spirit. Amen. And uh, um, it, it's this quickening is kind of like a leper who who g gained his senses back. Uh -huh. So he he's sensitive to things now. So he's not going to scrape himself up against something or cut himself and not realize it. He's he has that sensitivity back. And the, the same thing in in Christ, we gain a kind of an instant spiritual sensitivity when we come in. The, the things that are obviously wrong, we we know that's wrong. We, we, we don't have to slowly taper off of sinning. Well, I've only stole four times this week. I'm pretty good. you know. No, that's not the way it is in Christ. And it's, it's like a sight. It's like sight to the blind man. You know, Whenever the blind man gets his sight, he's, he's never going to walk into a dangerous situation again without realizing what he's walking into. Because he can see. He knows what's ahead of him. And, and it's the same way in Christ Jesus. Whenever we come in, we, we're able to see obvious deception. We, we've, we've been awakened to the deception that we have fallen prey to our entire lives. And we're able to, to navigate spiritually like we weren't able to before. And as, as we we come into Christ, this quickening enables us to see how how lame and how blind we really were before we came into Him. And now, in saying these things, I'm not implying that we get our full capacity whenever we first come in, but we grow in the ability to be able to do these things. We grow in our capacity to be able to, to soar up on high and to go onto the mountaintops, and we grow in our capacity to be able to, to be more spiritually sensitive, to be able to be sensitive of the things that will be harmful to our spirit. And, and we grow in our ability to be able to sense deception, to be able to tell the difference between the truth and a lie. And this is this is part of this quickening, this continual quickening. And this is the manner of our salvation. This is what we've been talking about in, in this last message, is that, that it's greater. It continually becomes greater and greater. You become more sensitive. You become closer to Christ. You become greater in your ability to be able to perceive these things. It's, it's an abundant salvation, brethren. Uh, it, it's not, um, whenever we're talking about Jesus being the way and the truth and the life, I like this thought that um, he, he sets us in the direction that we need to go. He points us in the direction we need to go. But, but as being, it, since he's the truth, he also uh, aware, makes us aware of the implications of where this path leads and, and um, what can happen if we depart from it. And, and he's the life, so he enlivens us to be able to have the energy to walk in this way. So, so all along the way, he is, he is leading to us. 
us. And, and we, we can do this with a confidence that only comes from a soul who's had the Spirit testify to their spirit that they're the Son of God. Amen. That's that's the thing about life in Christ. That's the thing about the quickening, is that it comes with this confidence that you know that you are in Him. That's that's something that, that, that can't be said of somebody who, uh, who just follows a regimented thing. You know, it's it's there's this spiritual confidence that you can't get any other way but through Christ. However, this isn't all. We haven't just been made into his likeness. We haven't just been quickened by him and changed in our, our nature, but we've actually been afforded a change in environment. That's what he says, and, and, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, that's a glorious thing, brethren. Now, e even if, when we were dead in trespasses and sins, uh, if, if God did so much to save us then, then how much will He do? How much abundance? In, uh, the, how much of the abundance of His goodness can we receive now that we are acceptable to Him? If, if, if He died for us while we were in, in trespasses and sins, now that we have been reconciled to Him, how much more shall we be saved by His life? Amen. See, we've been we've been raised up together with Christ in heavenly places. Uh, Jesus is in he, he's in heaven, appearing before God on our behalf presently, and and he's he sits on this throne of authority, being made head over all things to the churches. So he has the ability to be able to administrate these things, and he he's our advocate with the Father in heaven. Uh, he is our great high priest and our intercessor, and we've actually been raised up to sit in the heavenly places in which he all this activity is going. Going on, we don't have to receive this from far away. This is we have boldness to enter into the holiest. We have this this boldness to be able to approach the throne of grace and to be able to to find grace and fi to help in time of need. So we have access to sit at the feet of Jesus, and as as He's administering these things to the church, we can actually receive these resources so that we can function as the part of the body that we are, so that we can be beneficial to everyone else. Now this sitting that they're speaking of, sitting in these heavenly places, this is a preparation for glory. This is a preparation for the things that are to come. It's a taste of the first fruits of, of the things to come. It's We're tasting of the powers of the world to come presently. It, it's This is the place that we can find shelter in. It's, it, I, I had this thought that... Um, the lungs of flesh, so to speak, can't breathe the air that's up there. It's it's too high. It's it's too high for molesting influences to come and to, to come and get us. Satan has been cast out of those heavenly realms, and it's whenever we're up there and we sit together with Christ, we're kind of just like starving our flesh. As we're up there, then those appetites don't get don't get riled up, and we we set our affection on these things above while we're up there. This is the provision that that we want more and more of this goodness because we're tasting of it. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Amen. And this is the, the, the place where the things of the earth grow strangely dim, as, as the hymn writer wrote. It's, this is this is where we can cast our cares upon Him, and, and where the peace of God can rule in our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus. Now, I was thinking about this last week, because this is kind of a fresh perspective on, um, on this. You know, the promise that Jesus gave when He said, whenever two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And I used to always think it's talking about Jesus coming down to be with the two people. But that's not the manner of the covenant at all, is it? The, the, those two people are in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, so He's in the midst of them. That's the reason why. And, you know, the, the whole modern praise movement and everything, they're always talking about come down and come down unto us. That's 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 tabernacle talk is what that is. He come down and filled His Spirit in the tabernacle. No, we're dwelling in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. And, and this this is a, it's a fresh look on the assembly. Whenever we come together as the assembly, we all ascend together, so to speak, up in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And this is the reason why we're able to fellowship with the spirits of just men made perfect, because that's where they are. So whenever we we, uh, we speak these things that the brethren have written down in the past, or whenever we sing the hymns, it's like we're singing with those brethren while we're singing those songs. 
that was just a fresh perspective of that. I, I, I was just rejoicing and being able to see that this last week. Now, as the apostle continues in our text, he speaks of the fulfillment of this exhibition of the nature of God at the conclusion of this present world, and he actually transports us into the ages to come. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing to be transported there. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Now, in this, we see the reason for which he has he has done all this on earth to ready the bride into the to enter into the wedding feast. And we notice the nature of the language here. He doesn't say whenever uh, we're in the ages to come, he's going to show us some of his grace with his kindness. No, the riches of his grace with his kindness. Uh, he's he's not going to give us a view of it like the view that Moses had up on the mount. You know, he's not going to tell us, "I'm put my hand over you so I can show you my hinder parts." No. No, we're going to see him full face. We're not going to see him through a glass darkly then. No, we're going to see his glory full face. And you can imagine if the face of Moses shone that much that it, it frightened the people just from seeing that tiny bit of him. Can you imagine how radiant we are going to be on that day? It's no wonder that the hymn writer wrote, We shall shine as the stars of the morning with Jesus the crucified one. And we shall rise to be like him forever, eternally shine as the sun. Amen. Amen. Now, see, we, we've seen the riches of His grace presently in redeeming us to Christ Jesus. And, and we, we admit that even in the present, we cannot find out everything about this. That half has yet been told, even of the things that He has done to prepare us for that place. So, I, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor has even entered into the heart of the man the things that He has prepared for those that love Him. I mean, there's... What God has prepared for us in, in, in that time, it's incomprehensible in the present. And I, I was thinking about it, and uh, I realized the glory in, in, in Him shedding this grace and kindness upon us, it's, it's going to be glorious in, at more than one level. And that uh, um, here in Colossians 1.12, He talks about, uh, us being made meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And it's it's going to take a special people for us to be able to receive this. And he needs a people who are meet, so to speak, to be able to be partakers of this. That those who he's actually able to shed this abundant kindness and love upon without reservation. That not only is gonna is God going to get glory from shedding forth this this um kindness and grace, but He's going to be glorified in our reception of it. The the fact that we're actually able to receive it and that his, his grace is going to empower us and his mercy is, is going to um, constrain us to do the work that needs to be done in the, in the ages to come. Now this is this is just profound, brethren, that we're forever going to be joined to, to Christ, that we have actually been given the very righteousness of God. This cannot be said of anybody else but of the redeemed, that we are like grafted into the Godhead. This is a profound, profound thought. Uh, this is a more abundant blessing than I can even express right now that that uh, we will have this level of intimacy with God that we can't even, it's incomprehensible at this point in time. But we know that we want it, we know that we love it, and we're looking forward to it. Amen. Well, brother and I... I apologize that that's all I have for you this morning, but I, I trust that these things have been stimulating to your spirit. I mean, this, is, this was uh, very um, good for me to be able to see this. I just thank the Lord that we've been delivered from a lifeless approach to these things, that we're actually being able to see the truth of this and that, that it is glorious in us, that the, the richness of this place that we're going to go to, it never ceases to, to amaze us in, in the present time. That, that The fact that where we were, that we were dead in trespasses and sins, He was able to take those people and make them into the bride of Christ. Well, that is a weighty consideration. Thank you, brother.